Word says that we ought to lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, you gates. Lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty. He is the King of glory. I know that you know that there was a day when he was in a tomb, but he rose up early on a Sunday morning, and he established himself as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. If you know that the Lord is alive, if you know that the King of glory reigns, then you ought to open your mouth right where you are and give God praise right here, right now. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you so much that you are alive and well. We thank you that that tomb did not hold you down, but that you woke up and rose up early on a Sunday morning so that we might have life. So today, God, we lift you up as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We lift you up as our creator. We lift you up as our redeemer. And so today, we, without any shadow of doubt, give you all the praise and all the glory that is due unto your name. Father, we invite you to ignite this atmosphere. We invite you to move in this place. We invite you into our hearts. We invite you into our minds. And we say, Lord, have thine own way. Let all those who know that the Lord is the Lord of lords and the King of kings say amen and give God a hand clap of praise right where you are. Yes. Amen and amen. You may be seated here in the presence of God. Good morning and happy Sabbath, Beacon Life family. Oh, family, family, family. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about today because we are worshiping a Jesus that's alive. Oh, come on, we can do a little bit better than that. We serve a Jesus who defeated death, a, a Jesus that overcome all obstacles. Can we just bless the name of the Lord? because he is alive and well. Good morning and happy Sabbath being a life family. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen and amen. The word tells us, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And so listen, on behalf of our leadership here, on behalf of my family and I, I want to just welcome each and every one of you to the Beacon Light Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Kansas City, Missouri. This is the place to connect, the place to transform, and the place to serve. This is the place where regardless of your color, come on somebody, regardless of your gender, regardless of your past, this is the place where you belong. So we are excited that you have decided to worship with us here in the physical sanctuary, as well as all of you worshiping online. We welcome you today to our communion and resurrection weekend experience. Amen? Amen. We're all, we're going to talk about today is Jesus. If there's ever a church service where you wonder what the preacher's going to talk about, we're going to talk about Jesus. Amen? Amen and amen. But listen, before we get through all of those fun things, uh, we just want to, uh, I just got a, something I got to ask you all. Did you all pull up to the church today and see something a little bit different? Did you see something a little bit different? Listen, family, we this past week got a whole new sidewalk leading up to the front door of the church. Come on, somebody. We repaved our parking lot outside. Does it look good, family? 
Amen and amen. Listen, we are excited, uh, grateful to God that he allowed for us to have the means to do those projects. Uh, listen, and, and when you come back next week, uh, they're going to actually do a little bit more work so we can spruce it up a little bit. We're going to put some lines on the on the actual pavement. Uh, we're going to uh, fill in some of the gaps and all those things. We didn't we didn't complete those because the Sabbath came upon us. But but family, we, we are working our ways to renovating God's house. Amen. Amen. And, and listen, I just want to extend a thank you to each and every one of you who have been donors to our capital campaign project. Uh, you all were able to donate so that we didn't have to go into debt. Come on, somebody, to do those projects. Amen. Amen. And so, listen, we want to just say thank you all for your uh, sacrifices that you all have made. And we want to encourage you to continue to sacrifice to our capital campaign because, listen, I don't know about you, but I, I, I see a, a, another parking lot on the upper level of our church soon. I, I, I see that. And, and I see us renovating our kitchen area. I, I, I see that as well. But, but we can't do it alone. You know, I, I, I need some of my big ballers in here to go on and just cut a check. I ain't going to name you right now. It's Easter. I'll let it go. Uh, but, I, but I need you to go on and just cut a check to us. And, and not to me, but really to God's house and say, Lord, we want to beautify your house. And, and we want to encourage you to continue to give as we are seeking to raise more funds so that we don't have to go into debt at all. In fact, I'm just going to tell my finance elder, we're not going to go into debt. Amen. And we're going to go ahead and do this off the faithful sacrifices of God's people. But we are just praising God for allowing us to get those projects done in a quick enough time. We weren't displaced as a church. It wasn't uncomfortable for us. We're just praising God for what he is doing. Amen. Amen and amen. Listen, family, as we go and on, in, on Monday, as a matter of fact, I believe it's Monday. I don't know what dates are. I believe it's Monday. That's when we now enter into a new month. Amen. And so, listen, we all know that our focus this year has been for us to be kingdom focused, co-laboring with God in the building up of his kingdom. And every month we had a different particular focus. Well, listen, in the month of April, that's going to be our youth empowerment month, our children and youth empowerment month. Amen. Listen, we're going to be centering our children. We're going to have a whole lot of events and things for them. We're going to have our children churches. We're going to have our, uh, our, our youth cafes. Uh, next week, we're going to have our Pathfinder Sabbath. Amen. Amen. I know our Pathfinder leaders, the Taylor family, has been working diligently in making sure our young people are prepared for that service. And so we want to make sure we're all in attendance on next Sabbath as we lift up and encourage uh, uh, and support our young people for their venture. Amen. And we also want to encourage you, if you want to be a donor to our young people as they are preparing and raising funds for the campery in August, uh, we want to encourage you to do that, right? So you can go ahead and see the Taylor family uh, if you have any questions on how to sponsor and support some of our young people on that venture. And so that's going to be on next Sabbath. On April 13th, we're going to have a joint service here at our church where Beacon Light and Linwood is going to come together in support of our school, V. Lindsay. Amen. Amen. And so just like we did last year where we shut our doors down and we went on over to Linwood Temple Church, they're going to shut their doors down and they're going to be here in the house, okay, on the 13th of April. So come early because we're going to be a packed house. Amen. Amen. But it's going to be an awesome time as we support our young people at our school, our scholars, as we support your first lady, your superintendent, principal, all of the above for V. Lindsay. We want to make sure we're supporting her. So we want to encourage you to be uh, in attendance on that Sabbath. And that Saturday evening, there's going to be an alumni co-ed basketball game. As we're lifting up our alums for that weekend, we're going to have a whole basketball game. You might see your past out there on the court. Depending how the knees hold up, Thurston, uh, you might see me out there, but uh, we're going to have a good time, and we want to encourage everybody to be there. If you are over the age of eight, if you are 18 and up, it's going to be $5 for you to uh, attend. And the reason that we're asking for $5 is because we're trying to raise some funds to give our kids some scholarships. Amen? Amen. One of the biggest initiatives that we have taken on is, hey, we want to make sure that Christian education is not a financial burden for anybody. 
But we need our community, our constituents, which is this church, to also say, you know what, we want to make sure that we make it affordable for our young people to go to school. So that's just one of the means that we're going to be doing, just charging, just a small donation. Uh, our eighth grade class is going to be there. They're going to be doing all of the uh, 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 concession stands and what have you to raise funds as well. We want to make sure that we encourage our school. Can, can, we, uh, can we show a, a hand, can we raise our hand if we're going to support our school? Amen, amen. Praise God for you all. And listen, all throughout the month of April, we have a lot of different things going on for our young people. Uh, our youth director, Rhonda uh, Penny, has been putting on a number of events on Sunday, Wednesdays, and Saturdays. There are going to be different events for our young people. Starting on this Wednesday at 6 p.m. here in our church, there's going to be a, a conversation for our young people on just how do you deal with crime safety and, and fire safety and those types of things. Because one of the things about this month is that that we don't want to just have social events. No, we want to have empowering, enriching events so that our young people can leave this month saying, I am equipped with these tools so that I can be better successful in my endeavors in life. They're going to have so many different things on, uh, on fire safety and first aid, and uh, we're going to have stuff on crime awareness and, and beauty and image and all of these things. Uh, there's going to be on the 17th where we're going to have different barbers that come and give free haircuts to our young men and uh, people in the community. Listen, we got a lot going on, family. And we should be excited that we got a lot going on for our young people. Amen? Amen. And so, listen, we are looking for your support. We're looking for all of our young people to be in attendance. We're looking for your nieces and your nephews, folks who don't even show up to this church, but you have a connection to. We want to make sure that you invite them on out throughout this month. Can we do that, family? Amen and amen. And so, listen, family, today I am excited about today. This is the one weekend all across uh, the world where people have an emphasis on coming to church. Listen, I ain't going to judge you if you only are the, you know, the, the two, three times a year. We're not judging you on that. But I'm excited about this weekend because this is the weekend where many may be out there and they'll be uh, chasing bunny rabbits and all of that stuff. But we're here because we're celebrating Jesus. Maybe I'm in the wrong crowd today. Maybe I'm in the wrong church. We're here because we're celebrating Jesus today. That Jesus defeated death so that we might have eternal life. Are we glad in this house to celebrate a God who is alive and well? Are we excited to just welcome the presence of God in this house? To celebrate that God died on Friday, but early on a Sunday morning. He got up with all power in his hands and so that you and I might have eternal life. And because we got life, I think it's appropriate for us to stand to our feet and welcome and praise God in this moment for the life that you have. At this time, we're going to welcome one another. We're going to go to somebody, and I need you to tell that person, it is good to see you in the land of the living. I need you to go to somebody and give them a big hug, give them a handshake, and tell them it is good to see you because this is the day that the Lord has made because Jesus defeated death. Welcome, welcome, come on in, 
verses 14 and 15. Look at what God said when they come to his house. If my people who are called by my name watch this, watch this. It says, humble themselves and pray and seek my face not only coming and humbling yourself, but he said before you do that, look at this. Watch this. It says, and turn from their wicked ways. See what God says. Then, then, I will hear from, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. He didn't stop there. Look at what God said. This is from God. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to their prayer that is made in this place. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek him, he said, this is his promise. If we can only turn from our wicked ways, 
And he said, what are wicked ways? Those things we harbor in our hearts against others. Those bad things we do privately against God. He said, if we can confess them, he is able. He is comfortable enough to hear our prayers. And that's the promise of God himself to us. Let us pray. Lord, you have told us in your word that you will hear our prayers. We are here this morning from our various places of our board. You have lifted us up. You have allowed us to sleep well last night. You have allowed us to walk around all various places, our workplaces, wherever we visit the Lord and come home safely. You have allowed us to seek your peace in your holy temple. Lord, you have promised us if we can open our hearts, our mind, if we can only confess our sins to you, that you are holy enough, perfect enough to come down from heaven, come down from your holy place and dwell with us and forgive us our treasure. Father, this morning, we are privileged. And we are here in your presence, Father, to thank you. To thank you for these promises you have made to us. We know we are not worthy to call you by your name. But you have made it promise that if we who are called by your name, Jesus, if we who are called by your name come together, that you are holy enough to be in our midst. Father, this is a week where we remember what you did for us. Where we remember how you died on the cross. Remembering how you defeated Satan. Remembering how our sins were forgiven right there on the cross so that we have access to your Father. Father, it's that privilege we have this morning to thanking you for who you are. Blessed be to your holy name, all the praises, Father, to you and you only, because you are almighty. Father, this morning, we come to you with our open heart. That see through us, and forgive us, Father. Bless us. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For all the evil things we do privately and publicly. We put them in front of you, Father, this morning. Because you promised if we confess our sins, that you are enough to forgive us, Father. Individually, collectively, we confess our sins. Those things, knowingly, unknowingly, what we have done. Praise be to your holy name because he said you will forgive us, Father. We pray that you will forgive us this morning. Father, we lift up those amongst us who are sick. We lift up Sister E, who has been battling illness. We lift up the brother of Elder Brown, who has been in the hospital. We lift up many others who are at their various homes, battling illnesses. 
We don't know what they are, for that knows the heart of every one of us. You made us. You molded us. You know what is inside us. For I will pray this morning that you lift us all up, individually and collectively. Pray for our various homes, families. Pray for our children. We pray that you lift them up, that the Holy Spirit will continue to guide them, Father. We also pray for this nation. Yes, we, thank, we take it for granted that we have the freedom to do whatever we want to do. But that noise, Father, that freedom was bought by your blood on the cross. That we should not take it for granted. Bless our leaders. Bless our president, the congressmen, the senators, all those who are making the decisions that affect us every day. Father, we pray for our churches. Christianity is going through upheaval. Men's hearts are growing cold. For our body, I promise you, no matter what happens, you are always in control. Father, this morning, we bring our church big in life, in your presence. We bring the leaders. We lift up our pastor as he leads this congregation. We pray that I will continue to give him the knowledge, the wisdom, and the patience to hold up, protect him from all harms and dangers. For as we continue to praise your name this morning, as we partake of that Holy Communion, he commissioned that we do this in remembrance of your Father. After taking it, may our life not be the same. May we have peace. The mind that sees you as our Lord and Savior. Bless us all, Father, and above all, please, Father, Accept our worship this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Sabbath, everyone. Uh, this is the time that we have children's story, and I am not going to sing for you. I'm sure you're happy about that. But we are going to have children's story now, so if all the little ones will come up, come up please.
Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning, boys and girls. You don't want to wish me a happy morning? No? Uh, you do? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that greatly. You know, tomorrow is Resurrection Sunday. What happened on Resurrection Sunday? Does anyone know? What happened? Jesus rose. Jesus rose from the dead. Exactly. So you might want to even call it Substitution Sunday. Do you know why we should call it Substitution Sunday? Anybody? Well, tell you what, at the end of this story, I'm hoping that everybody will be able to tell me why we should call it Substitution Sunday. There was, there were a couple of men named Damon and Pythias, two best friends in an ancient Greek city. And they were best friends who lived in a city ruled by a bully. Does anyone know what a bully is? A bully, a bad person. Yeah. A bully named Dion Dionysius. I can't even pronounce his name, he's so bad. Who decided to kill Pythias. He wanted to kill Pythias, he wanted to get rid of him. That's not nice, is it? No. So what he did was, he brought Pythias up on trumped up charges and tried to get him executed. That wasn't very nice, was it? No. So they convicted him and they said, well, we're going to get rid of you. And he said, well, okay, do me a favor. As a last request, I would like to go home and put my affairs in order. Say bye to my mom and dad and my aunt and uncle and my, my, my aunt uh, Gertrude and, and you know, maybe have last meal with them and all that stuff and everything. And, and so this mean king said, okay, we'll, we'll let you do that, but I gotta have somebody to stay here in your place because if you don't come back, I'm gonna get rid of them. And so Pithy said, well, I, I don't know. Um, but his friend Damien jumped up and he said, I'll do it. I'll take his place. And the king said, okay, now, if he doesn't come back, we're going to get rid of you. And Damon said, okay, uh, I don't want get, to get gotten rid of, but I'll, I'll take his place. I'll be his substitute. So they set the date on which they were going to get rid of Pythias, but Pythias went to see his family. And the day rolled around that they were supposed to get rid of him. And guess what? Damon hadn't shown up. So, things were getting kind of bad here, because like, you know, Pythias is out jamming with the family and having food and eating and all this stuff, and Damon's in prison waiting to get done away with because Pythias hasn't shown up. So, they were going out to the place where they were going to get rid of Pythias, and guess what happened? Damon showed up. Damon showed up. And Pythias said, hey, man, why were you so late getting back? They almost got rid of me. He said, well, you know, I was having a good time, and Aunt Bernadine makes some nice peach cobbler, so, you know, I... He said, well, why didn't you just get a go box like everybody else do? He said, well, okay, well, I, I'm here now. But you know what happened? The mean bully king was so impressed with the fact that Pythias came back so that Damon wouldn't have to take his punishment. Guess what he did? Anybody got a guess? What did what he do? I, he was so proud that Yeah, he was happy that he didn't have to kill him, but anybody know what happened? What, what really happened? What, why was the king, what, what did the king do? He let them both go 
He let them both go because he said, this man loved his friend so much that he was willing to give himself for him. He was willing to be a substitute for him. And guess what? Jesus Christ was a substitute for us. Jesus died on the cross for us because quite honestly, say what? <laughs> quite honestly, I can't be good enough. I can't be good enough to go to heaven. Okay? And I, I'm, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, but you can't be good enough either. You have to allow Christ to be your substitute. And it's not just enough to believe that Jesus is your substitute, okay? Because you, do you know what a demon is? What's a demon? Satan's angels. Exactly. A demon is a bad angel. And even they believe in Jesus. But guess what? Ain't none of them going to heaven. You know why? Because they've never received Christ as Savior and Lord. So, if you let Christ be your substitute and let him take care of the righteousness that you don't have and you receive him, as Savior and Lord, then you can make it into heaven. Now, as I said, tomorrow is Resurrection Day, and they have put in some substitutes for the fact that Christ died on Resurrection Day. And you know what those substitutes are? Chicks and eggs. They, they hunt Easter eggs and all that. What, what, is, what, what does that got to do with Christ? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. So what man will do many times is try to make substitutes. But when we make substitutes, they're not like the substitutes that God makes. Because God made the substitute of Christ for us. All right. Who would like to pray? Come here, gentlemen. Come on. Come on. Both of you. All right. Dear Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for waking us up. Thank you for letting us be here at this church today. Th thank you that we just get together to just be with you and just to know and just as we get here, are here, we just come together to know you better and, and that we, and so that we, and so that we all believe and, and endure to the end to, to go to heaven with you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Dear Jesus, thank you for this day. Um, thank you for a wonderful day. Um, thank you for keeping us safe. And, 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 and when everybody goes home, um, keep them safe and keep my dad safe when he drives to work on on tonight in jesus name amen amen okay that's it now as you're going back to your seats i'm going to tell you another quick little story there, go ahead you can go ahead there was a, a a sabbath school teacher who was teaching sabbath school and she told all the kids how they could be sure that they go to heaven. She said, if you receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, you can go to heaven. And then she asked the kids, who all wants to go to heaven? Raise your hand. And so all the kids raised their hands except one boy. And she walked over to the little boy and she said, Tommy, you don't want to go to heaven? And he said, yeah. And she said, well, why didn't you raise your hand? And he said, well, I thought you was getting a group together to go right now. I'm not ready to yet.
Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My death to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I So glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My dad to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on you. And 
you're seated in majesty. You are the risen King. Is anybody grateful for the things that God has done for you? The ways he's made for you? Hallelujah.
abandoned me. God was still by our side. I got a reason to be grateful. When I got into that car accident and I walked away without a scratch, I got a reason to be grateful. When you went through that divorce and people said that you were not lovable anymore. But God said that you still have value. There's a reason to be grateful. When you were lying on that hospital bed, not quite sure if you're going to make it out of tomorrow, but you still have breath in your body. There is still blood flowing through your veins. You have a reason to be grateful. When you contemplated taking your life, and those pills were right by your side. But somehow, some way, God blocked that. You have a reason to be grateful. And if that's not any of your story, you may not have been through anything traumatizing. Breathe in and breathe out. You have a reason to be grateful. So Father, in this moment, we pause just to extend our gratitude to you. Thank you for being a faithful God to us. Thank you for loving us when nobody else did. Thank you for protecting us when we were in danger. Thank you for covering our children when they were away from our presence. Thank you for being who you are. Father, as we come to this moment where we want to hear closer, hear more from you, I pray that you blot out all distractions. Pause the world just so we can listen to you. Tune our ears, Father, to the frequency of heaven so that we might receive something that leads to transformation. And that ultimately leads to a commitment to you. Father, I pray for myself that you consecrate me, Lord, for thy service. By the power of grace divine. And may my soul look up with a steadfast hope. And may my will be lost in dying. May everything that I've studied, God, come out with power and clarity. But may everything I did not study due to my own human frailty, I ask that it comes out with greater power, greater clarity, so that we may experience a demonstration of what the power of God looks like through human frailty. Have thine own way, God, in Jesus' name. Let all those who are grateful say amen and amen. <clears throat> We 
give God praise in this moment for our worship team. We thank God for you all for ushering in the atmosphere of the presence of God. And as we turn to this moment, I want to invite you to stand for the reading of the word. And I want to call our attention to a familiar resurrection weekend passage of scripture. I want to invite your attention to the gospel according to Luke chapter number 24. And we'll be looking at verses 1 through 12. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. The New International Version reads it this way. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the woman who took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living <laughs> among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners. Be crucified and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Verse 9, when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene. Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Verse 12 to conclude. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away wondering to himself what had happened. For just a brief few moments, I want to share under the subject, just what I needed. Just what I needed. Holy Spirit, do thy will. Do thy will, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we do declare, amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Just what I needed. <clears throat> Here in Luke chapter 24, early on a Sunday morning, we find a group of women taking spices they had prepared to the tomb of Jesus. Jesus, the sinless one. Jesus, the chosen Messiah, the miracle worker, the one who was born in a manger. Jesus, the one who came to seek and save the lost, the one who gave hope to the hopeless has died. And in case you missed the memo, Jesus did not die a peaceful death in a home surrounded by loved ones and friends. He didn't have a death that came consequently due to old age. No, he died a violent and gruesome death of crucifixion, spearheaded and perfected by the Roman Empire. The women who had come to know him uh, as the Messiah made their way to the tomb only to discover that the stone had been rolled away. The body of Jesus was not there. And almost immediately as they were struck with concern and wonder, the Bible says that suddenly men wearing clothes that gleamed like lightning appeared and shared with them the good news that Jesus was not at the tomb because Jesus had risen. And when these women heard the words that Jesus had risen, they immediately remembered what Jesus had told them in Galilee, that he will be crucified, that he will die, he will be buried, but he also will be raised up in three days' time. 
They remembered what Jesus had told them, and they are in a space of realizing, Elder, that it came to pass. Uh, they realized that Jesus was not just talking smoke. No, Jesus was for real. That when Jesus tells you something, it's going to come to pass. And can I just take a brief moment uh, uh, early in this message to join in with the early birds who caught what I was throwing out there? Can we just have a moment where we just bless the name of the Lord? Because we serve a God who means what he says and says what he means. Can we take a moment to just praise God to bring to pass what he said will happen? Can we praise God for the times when he told you that you will get a job and you got that job? Can we praise God for when he said your children will be covered and they were covered? Uh, for the times he said he will provide all your needs and he did it for when he said he's going to handle that water bill and he actually did handle that water bill. Is there anybody in here who can testify that God is a God who means what he says and he says what he means? Remembering that Jesus said he will rise again. And seeing it come to pass, these women who were at the grave site of Jesus now become overwhelmed with joy and adulation to the point where they rush away from the graveside to go tell somebody who they or what they had discovered. These women, headlined by Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, find the remaining 11 disciples who were alive to tell them the good news that Jesus is alive. They share that the prophetic messianic utterance has come true. Jesus defeated death and is alive. Death lost and Jesus is the victor. Yet in the midst of this declaration of good news of the women to the apostles, that's where we discover the discipline of tension in the discourse of the text. These women are sharing the good news that Jesus is alive. But the narrative never insinuates that the apostles join in on the celebration of this news. There's no praise party that ensues. There is no countenance of jubilation in the room. Instead, at the dispersion of the good news that Jesus has risen and is alive, the disciples exhibit a spirit of disbelief in the good news of the resurrection. The disciples dismiss the entire ideology that Jesus has risen to the point that they declare that what the women were saying was nonsense. The King James Version doesn't use the word nonsense. It uses the phrase idle tales, which is a medical term used to describe the babbling of a fevered and insane man. The apostles believed that what these women were saying was that it was so nonsensical that they must be unwell and delusional in what they were saying. And what makes this much more disturbing is that the apostles not believing the women had nothing to do with their identity as women. Scholars would suggest that these women were actually women of high influence to the disciples. Mary Magdalene had a close relationship with Jesus because Jesus had casted seven demons out of her, resulting in her having a high level of commitment to him. Joanna was the wife of Chusa and was the manager of King Herod's affairs meaning that she was a woman, woman of privilege and resources. And Mary, the mother of James, was the mother of one of the apostles in the room. Because of the status of these women, the apostles would have normally believed them. But in relationship to Jesus' resurrection, they didn't believe the women not because they were women, but they didn't believe them because they never expected Jesus to rise. And to make matters worse, Peter went down to the tomb himself to see for himself. And he saw that the body of Jesus wasn't there and he still did not believe. Beloved, the reason why the apostles not believing that Jesus was going to rise is problematic 
is because these unbelieving apostles, these church folk, had been walking with Jesus for three and a half years. For three and a half years, these apostles sat at the feet of Jesus every day listening to his teaching. For three and a half years, these apostles saw Jesus heal the sick and give sight to the blind. For three and a half years, they saw Jesus walk on water and calm treacherous storms. Uh, they saw him do the impossible by feeding 5,000 people, not including women and children with just five loaves and two fishes. Uh, for three and a half years, they witnessed Jesus resurrect dead people back to life in Jairus' daughter and Lazarus. For three and a half years, they had been told over and over again that Jesus is going to die and he's going to be raised up in three days. For three and a half years, these apostles were being prepared for this moment, groomed for this situation of Jesus being prepared, raised from the dead, but they still did not believe him and expect that he was going to get up. These ain't no non-street folk. These is church folk. These are church folk who had been walking with a Jesus they didn't believe in. And here is the prophetic utterance for today. How many of us are moving in the same spirit of skepticism that the apostles had? We're walking with Jesus, but we're not believing in that Jesus. We are walking with a Jesus that's showing us that he still heals, that's showing us that he still restores family, that he still can break chains. Uh, but at the same time, you are doubting the power of God and what he can really do for you. It's a tight moment. I don't expect us to shout, but it is what it is. You're living in a space where you believe you claim to love God. There's no question to that. But you're still doubtful and in disbelief because things aren't going the way you dreamed them to go. And the fact of the matter is this. Many of us have been socialized into a spirit of skepticism. A spirit of intellectual attitude that involves questioning or doubting the validity and truthfulness of claims, beliefs, or assertions until sufficient evidence is provided to support them. In other words, you don't believe God can do for you until you actually see him do it. And hear me on this church. This is the very spirit of skepticism that has caused many of us to have stagnant and lifeless relationships with God because it is this very spirit that is saturated by your own ego and self-entitlement rather than submission and sincerity to God. The apostles were walking every single moment of the day for 365 days one year, 365 days the second year, 365 days the third year. You do the math for the half a year. Uh, he walked with them all those times and still didn't believe him. They were given every evidence possible to believe but they still did not believe. And I wonder today, because of the skepticism that my spirit feels is in this very room, how much evidence do you need to start trusting God? Because some of us want God to do this elaborate thing. God, I'm going to know that it's you if you do this by this way and it has to have this, that, that. You want some evidence? Can I give you some evidence that God is worthy to be trusted? Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Can you wiggle your fingers? Can you stand to your feet? Can you move your head? Can you jump up and down? Can you clap your hands? Can you open up your mouth? That's evidence enough that God is worthy to be trusted, that God is worthy to be worshipped, that God is worthy to be praised. And is there anybody who just 
just wants to bless the name of the Lord because he's given you enough evidence to be trusted. Even though, even though the resurrection demonstrates to us that the disciples possessed a spirit of skepticism, I want to submit and suggest that it also highlights for us the key foundation to what the gospel is all about. Because when we think about the purpose of the cross, the cross's purpose was to bear the weight and responsibility of all of our sins. And the resurrection of Jesus defeating death uh, uh, was about us claiming the victory of eternal life in in Jesus. And when this is highlighted with the skepticism of the apostles that existed before Jesus died and after he raised, what this shows us about the resurrection of Jesus is that Jesus still believed that you were worth saving. Some of y'all ain't going to get that, and that's all right. But to anybody in here who has ever done something that you've been ashamed of and something you're not proud of and something that is filling you with guilt and you ever doubted that because of what you've done, you doubt whether or not God loves you and thinks that you're valuable, I need you to know today that the resurrection is just what you needed. It is just what you needed. That despite of you, God died for you. That despite of you, he rose up again. That despite you not believing Believing in him. He says, you're worth it. Oh, can we just praise the name of the Lord that Jesus died and he rose again from the dead just for you, despite of you. You walked with Jesus. You still doubted him. And he says, I'm still going to die for you. Jesus said, despite of you, I'm still going to die for you. And I'm still going to get up for you. Because you are still valuable. There is still something inside of you that is worth it. In fact, even if you don't think there is, the sheer fact that we're connected together, the sheer fact that you're my child, the sheer fact that I created you out of nothing, the sheer fact that I knew your name before you, you were a matter little thought of by your parents, the sheer fact that you are alive and well is proof positive that you are valuable and worth dying and raising up for So two things I want to teach and share with you, and I'll be done, is that the women in the text, they teach us some things. When you realize that Jesus died for you, despite you, you will then now have visions of vitality in dark places. You'll have visions of vitality in dark places. You got to understand that when Jesus was crucified on Friday, uh, the Bible teaches us that Joseph of Arimathea, who was a wealthy member of the Judaic council, he goes to Pilate and begs for the body of Jesus. When he finally gets permission to take the body, he buries Jesus in his own tomb. Now, you have to understand that this tomb is, a, is like a little cave. It's, a, it's a, a little room cut out of rock that has most likely has a standing pit in it, and it has a, a burial bench in it. And at the entrance of that tomb, there's a stone that's positioned there. Now, there's there's multiple reasons why that stone is there. The first reason is to provide security measures to prevent unauthorized access or disturbance of the burial chamber. The next reason is so that it can preserve the contents of the burial chamber from the body to and burial items and offerings. And the third reason that stone is there is to respect the dead and their resting place. But the thing that I need you to know 
is that this stone that's placed in front of the tomb is not something that you can just push uh, haphazardly. It's something where you need a couple of people and with brute force to push this thing out of the way. And so if someone were to happen to get caught inside of that, uh, it would be a whole thing where people would have to push out that stone. Uh, But here's the thing that I need you to see. Stay with me. I'm going to encourage you to read later uh, the different accounts. When you look at all four of the gospel accounts of this story, there is no indication, and it's going to mess with some of your theology here, but there's no indication that when the stone had been rolled away by the angel that Jesus walked out. There's no indication. The writers don't say that at all. In fact, What it insinuates is that when the stone was rolled away, Jesus was already gone. You there? You there? This is so important to note because what the resurrection shows us is that Jesus was no longer bounded by walls. The properties of his physical body had changed. And if you go to John chapter 20, verse 19, when Jesus revealed himself to his disciples, the word says that the disciples were in a locked room and then Jesus showed up, which implies that Jesus had to walk through a wall to get into the room. Are you there? Are you there? Which is significant because Jesus' ability to walk through the walls means that when the angel rolled the tomb away, it was not to let Jesus out. He rolled the the, the, the stone away so that others could see inside. (laughs) Ah! Uh, uh, It wasn't for Jesus to leave. It was for the people on the outside to look inside. Uh, It was for them to look inside and to see a dark cave. And inside a dark cave, they would see that there was linens there, that it was empty, that life began to come out of a dark place. In other words, the stone was rolled away so that in a place where death was evident, life can come forth. It was given a vision of vitality, a vision of life coming into dead places. And I need us to know, family, that when you realize that Jesus has died for you, despite of you, your vision begins to change. You realize that with Jesus on your side, it don't matter how dark life can get. It don't matter how grim it may may become. That when Jesus comes, you begin to know that life's about to come forth. That life's about to spring forth. That the darkness is about to shine. Why? Because the tomb is empty. Praise God that this story teaches us that life can come forth in dark places. That we still have life even though it seems like it's dead. When all seems lost, God says, look inside. There's no more dead body. Why? Because Jesus is alive. So when you realize this man died for me despite of me, oh, my vision changes now. You can't tell me nothing. I can go through hell and high water. I know I'm going to be all right because I know that Jesus is not bounded by the walls of my situation. Jesus is not confounded by what the world says. Why? Jesus can walk through it all and Jesus can talk through it all. And all that means is if I trust in him, life is going to happen in these places. So when you realize that Jesus died for you, despite of you, you now have a vision of vitality. But the second and last point I want to make is that when you realize that Jesus has died for you, despite of you, the vocality of your vernacular changes. The vocality of your vernacular changes. Let me make it plain. You start talking, 
and speaking a little bit differently. Your tone begins to shift. Uh, you begin to, to say some things you've never said before and, and walk with a level of boldness and confidence that you never walked with before. Go back to the story, please. Story begins by telling us that early on that Sunday morning, the women are bringing spices they had prepared to the tomb. Now, you got to understand that Joseph of Arimathea, uh, after he got the body from, uh, uh, from the cross and uh, was about to put it into the tomb, he, he took his spices and he, he poured 100 pounds of the spices on him and he just wrapped Jesus up and put him in the tomb. But it was a rest job because he was trying to make sure that he had Jesus in the tomb before the Sabbath. Uh, 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 but the women, the Bible says, saw Joseph of Arimathea do that. And what they did was they went home themselves on that Friday and they began preparing the spices because that's part of the cultural, that's part of the custom to make sure you put the spices on the body, to embalm the body. To, it, was a, it was a sacred thing. So, so the women were trying to fix the rust job that the brother did on Friday. That's another sermon for another day. Y'all get what I'm saying? Uh, so so they, they go uh, they want to do it correctly, so they, they come early in the morning. Uh, but you also got to recognize that they're mourning as well. Uh, so uh, imagine the scene, if you will. The sun hasn't risen yet. They wake up in the morning. The women start covering themselves fully. They have their spices in hand, and they're walking to the gravesite. They're walking. They're lamenting. They're crying out loud. Tears are streaming down their faces. Uh, they're singing songs when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. They're, they're singing songs. Uh, they're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. They're, they're watching. They're marching. They're, they're walking to the grave site, mourning and lamenting. But when they get to the tomb, they can now engage with an angel who tells them, hey, Jesus it's alive. They, they realize Jesus is alive. And the Bible says they hurry home now. They, 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 they go on home and they, now they start telling everybody, hey, 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 hey. Jesus is alive, Jesus is alive, Jesus is alive, Jesus, Jesus is alive, Jesus is alive. They, they, they start running. Uh, 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 their tone and now begins to shift. Amen. Stay with me, y'all. They went to the tomb crying. They leave the tomb praising. They go to the tomb with tears of sorrow streaming down their face. And they go back home with tears of joy streaming down their face. Uh, they leave, they go there depressed and in a dark place. But now they leave there happy. They leave there jumping. Oh, the vocality of their vernacular changes. They, they start the, that first they were saying, oh, Lord, oh Lord, have mercy. Why, Jesus? Why, Jesus? And now they're singing, oh, blessed be the name. Jesus is alive. They're now praising. They're now shouting. They're now jumping. They're now hooping. They're now hollering. Why? Because in, they realize that the resurrection changed what they said. When you realized that he died for you, despite of you, that changes everything. God, I trust you now. God, you're worthy of it all. God, I love you more than everything. Lord, I'm grateful. It changes the vocality of your vernacular. When you realize that he died and he rose for you, you now speak life. Imagine the mother in the morning. Where are you going? I'm going to see a dead Jesus. And imagine when they came back. How was your experience, man? I know that Jesus is alive. It changes, it changes your entire atmosphere. It changes it all. And that just tells me 
that for a sinner like me, the resurrection is just what I needed. I needed to be in a space where I understood that he died for me. That it changes my vision into one of vitality. And it changes the vocality of my vernacular. Because now I know I live in the valuable victory of Jesus. That is why we partake in the communion experience. That is why we celebrate the resurrection. This is why, this is why we shout and celebrate Jesus. Because not only did he die, but he rose up again. I praise God for the death on the cross. But I get a little bit more happier to know that the very thing I was supposed to die for, he exchanged it and took my place as the substitute. And not only did he die, but he said, as I'm dying here, I'm also going to lift myself up so you can see that there is still life in for you. So let's change our voice today and give God everything because that's just what I needed.
Has anyone been omitted? And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Dear Lord, we thank you for this bread, which symbolizes your body. Thank you for the fact that you gave yourself for us. Thank you for the fact that you were beaten and bruised beyond recognition so that we could have eternal life with you. Thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Father God, we thank you for your blood that was shed for us. And as we partake of this, we ask that you will help us to understand the significance and the importance of this and accept it, for you did it for us, and we thank you. Amen. For I received from the Lord, but I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Eat ye all. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Drink ye all. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that this is just what we needed to be reminded of the sacrifice of your blood, body and the blood of yours that was shed. We thank you for that because you did it despite the skepticism and doubt that is inside many of us. We question whether or not you are able to. We question or not whether you can. But God, today we are reminded as we reflect on the body and the blood that was shed. But that same body and blood that was resurrected for us, it is proof that we are valuable and we were worth saving. So God, may this not just be another ritual that we partake in, but may this be a lifestyle commitment that we will walk this journey with you now and the days ahead. We thank you, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name we do declare, amen and amen. As our elders transition to their seats, I will be remiss in this moment. As we talked about the resurrection of Jesus and how in that moment the people that had walked the closest with him were the biggest skeptics about him. But the good news about the cross is that it invites us to move from skepticism into all-out trust in him. And so I extend the invitation to somebody today. The spirit of skepticism has gripped you. You've known Jesus all your life. You show up every week. You're a ministry leader, officer here in the church. 
But you know that there are some things that you're going through that you doubt whether or not God has the power and ability to do it for you. Well, today is an opportunity that we extend to you. If you are someone in, who has been experiencing that, I want you to come forward. I want to pray for you. I want to cover you. I want you to move forward without apology. Because if there's one thing that the cross has taught us, it's that it's not about covering things up. It's about exposing and being honest. And there's nothing wrong with, with you. You're human, family. You're human. We all doubt. We all got some challenges. We all got it. It's not a moment to be ashamed because you're not coming down here because the person standing next to you. You're coming down because this is an intimate moment between you and God. I need to remind you today that the cross, the resurrection is just what you needed because it's that very thing that keeps us going. It gives me hope that in my darkness, there's life that can be birthed in that because the God that we serve is not bounded by our own situations and when you realize what Jesus has done for you despite of you y'all your tone changes your ego leaves the pride walks away if there's anybody who even wants to take it a little bit farther say Lord I want to give my life to you in baptism Lord I want to go into further study with you to know what your word is teaching and telling me Father I, Lord I, I, I want somebody to help walk me down this journey because it's a struggle to do it by myself I want to join this church because this is the place where I feel I can grow with God. If that's you, just raise your hand. Praise God. Praise God. This is the moment where we draw near to Jesus. Because he drew near to us. Jesus didn't have to think about dying for us. When the plan of salvation was initiated Jesus volunteered and said I'll do it centuries passed and he stayed committed to that path even in the garden of Gethsemane when he questioned Lord let this cut pass for me if it's your will but nevertheless I'm going to still press forward with the plan because Jesus understood that his people need a bit of hope in darkness. And that when they realize what he has done for you, it will change your tone. So Father, we thank you that the cross and the tomb are not just moments in history but it is a culture it is a lifestyle that still impacts us today it still has transformative power God today as individuals as a collective body we ask for forgiveness for the times that we've walked this life with you and doubted you God when all you have done has give us evidence that you're trustworthy. So God, right now, we repent of our unbelief. We ask for forgiveness of it, God. But we're also thankful, God, in this moment. And we praise you. Because you didn't allow time to run out before we could come to you in forgiveness. 
So God, we say thank you for the cross. Thank you for the tomb, which shows us what you can do. It, is, it encourages us, Father, and we say thank you. It gives us hope, Father, so we say thank you. It gives us something to look forward to. Because when we realize what the death on the cross did and the resurrection at the tomb did, we're excited about that great day when that trumpet will sound, those clouds will part, and we'll see you coming down. And because we finally moved from skepticism to faith, you will call us up and we will be caught up together to live with you in eternity. Thank you that because of Jesus, we have an eternity to go to. So Father, it is our prayer in this moment for everyone under the sound of my voice here in the physical sanctuary, as well as those in the virtual space. It is my prayer, God, that you strengthen us, God, to go down this journey. Tomorrow will be difficult and pose doubt. Next week will be hard, God. Next year will be hard. But by the power and the grace of God, we will stand and look at doubt and say, you have no power over me. Because I serve a God who has given me a vision of life in darkness. I serve a God who has changed the vernacular of my tomb language. And I, I speak hope and I speak life now. Why? Because he died for me. I don't cry tears of sorrow anymore. I cry tears of joy. Because what everyone has forsaken me, you have not, God. When the doctors have said no, God, you have said yes. So we move in that hope today. We move in the power of the resurrection. Because that's just what we needed. So we thank you, God, for knowing what we've needed long before we even knew. And we're grateful that the power of the cross, the power of the resurrection, will be what we need to get through anything that comes our way. So help us to hold on to that hope, to move with it now and forevermore. This be our prayer. In Jesus' name we do declare. Let all those who know that the resurrection was just what you needed, give God a hand clap of praise. Bless the name of the Lord. Amen and amen. We worship God this morning when we gave him our praise, gave him the honor and the glory. We listened for his word this morning, this afternoon, and hopefully it pierced our hearts and it's put into our minds what needs to be there for us to accept him more. We gave our time. No one made us come here today, amen. And if they did, aren't you glad they did? And we are grateful that we serve a risen God, a risen Savior. At this time, we're going to take up the tithe and the offering. That is something that we freely give because God has given to us. We don't own it. We give it back to him. We let him bless it. And we are blessed. Amen? Amen. Amen. And will the deacons come forth to lift this, morning's, this afternoon's tithe and offering? Let us pray. Father God in heaven, first of all, we just thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you that we have offering and tithes to return. And for those who have not, we know that you will continue to bless them. We ask that you will take these funds, and they're, they're your funds, Lord. Do what you will to help further your word, to get your message out, because you will soon return, and everyone needs to hear 
bless us and keep us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Malachi chapter 3, starting with verse 10. It says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If it will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing, that there will be room, no room for it. How many of us could use some blessings in there? You don't have enough room. You want to be able to turn away a blessing? I don't know about turning away one, but we do want to be able to receive them, right? Did we get any blessings this week? Amen. Amen. All right. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fare to fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. You ever had something in your house and you forgot to put it up, you cook, and you think, oh, I hope it doesn't spoil? You know, you spent money on it, and then you, oh, I didn't put it up, and you come back and it's still good? That's how the blessings are from God. They don't spoil. They don't, they don't expire. They, they, if, you, if you do right by God, he's going to bless you. And we may not have thousands or hundreds or maybe 50 <laughs> pouring out of our pockets, but we have blessings that we can name one by one. And if we're honest, we could be here all day naming those blessings. Can we give God praise in this moment? Amen. Were you blessed by our worship experience on today? It's my sincere prayer that you all were, that we all take what we've encountered today, uh, and we take it and we move forward with it. At this time, we just want to acknowledge before we close our worship experience, do we have any guests that have been worshiping with us? Uh, if you are a guest, first-time visitor, or something like that. We just want to acknowledge you. Raise your hand if you're here, if you're watching online. Uh, just put it in the chat. We want to welcome and thank you for worshiping with us. I uh, want to remind you all, good to see you. Glad that you're here with us today. I uh, want to just remind you all that April is our Youth Empowerment Month and that we have a whole lot of things designed for our youth starting on this Wednesday with the fireside chat on safety and first Fire safety and first aid, we want to encourage you to come on out at 6 o'clock to all of our young people. Uh, be about an hour or so. Come on out uh, and enjoy that time for our young people. And then next Sabbath, we have our Pathfinders Day. Come on, say amen. amen. I know we got like 50, 700 Pathfinders up in here. I hope to see you in your full garb next week. Hallelujah. Amen. The church said amen. Uh, but listen, we are looking forward to that experience that we have. And also want to remind you that on this Wednesday, we will be back with our Power Hour virtual prayer meeting experience um, on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, via our Zoom platform. At this time, let us stand for the benediction of, for this morning as we close. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for this experience on today. Thank you, Lord, that the resurrection is just what we needed, God. Thank you, Father, that for everything we've encountered today, from the liturgical as aspects, the songs, the music, everything, God, we say thank you for that experience on today. And Father, I pray that what we encountered on today is stored up into our hearts so that when we are tempted to lose perspective, we will be reminded that the cross and the resurrection is just what we needed. Thank you, Lord, for everything you've done for us. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we do declare, amen and amen. Deacon Life family, I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Consider yourselves dismissed. <laughs>